U.S. Institute of Peace was founded by Congress in 1984, dedicated to the proposition that peace is a very practical undertaking, that it's indeed possible, and it's essential for our uh, national and international security. So we work with partners around the world in hot spots, uh, seeking to apply the best research, technologies, and uh, practices for preventing and resolving violent conflict around the globe. Um, we were founded originally with very strong bipartisan support from Congress, so we recognize the importance of members of Congress working to together to address critical challenges for American security, and in that spirit, we inaugurated this series. Um, we are very pleased to be joined this morning by Congressman Steve Pierce from New Mexico and Congressman Jim Himes from Connecticut for this second event um, to discuss how the U.S. can prevent illicit funding of terrorism, especially in this critical moment of technical, uh, technological disruption. Um, we are seeing how technologies present enormous opportunities around the world, and in fact, several years ago, USIP uh, created uh, a sister organization called Peace Tech Lab, which is using um, media, technology, and data to accelerate and scale technical solutions for peace building. But we also know that there's substantial risk for exploitation of these technologies by terrorists, criminals, traffickers, and others. Um, so we've long looked at economic sanctions as a tool to rein in illicit activities, but we're seeing that non-state actors in particular, terrorist groups like ISIS, Boko Haram, and others, are using new technologies and new tactics uh, to fund their operations and evade any law enforcement. So policymakers have a real challenge. Uh, they, what's, they have the challenge of creating new mechanism uh, to stem the tide of money to extremist groups um, and uh, a growing urgency to do so. We are very grateful that Congress has identified this as an issue to address. Um, and uh, our featured guests today are at the forefront of those efforts through their work on the House Financial Services Subcommittee on Terrorism and Illicit Finance. And it's a new subcommittee. It was started just last year, and it's chaired by Congressman Pierce. And I look very much forward to a conversation today about a lot of issues that uh, probably not enough of us are well versed in understanding. Um, I invite all of you to follow uh, USIP on Twitter and join today's conversation with the hashtag USIP Bipartisan. I also want to encourage you to listen to our new podcast. Uh, it's at usip.org backslash podcasts. And that will include this event and many other events uh, so that you can listen to it later. Um, I also want to give a, spe a special shout out um, to those from Greenwich High School and Fairfield University who are joining us of, um, uh, in co from Congressman Himes' district. Um, and welcome to all of you who are joining us uh, by a live, live stream. And with that, please join me in welcoming to the stage Congressman Steve Pierce and Congressman Jim Himes. There? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I had intended to uh, start with posting this Fortinet threat map, so I would ask you sometime to look it up. It's a real-time look at the hacks that are uh, flying back and forth, the attempts to penetrate systems, and it goes on 24 hours a day. So uh, call it up in Fortinet threat map, and uh, you should get that. Here's your. Uh, before I drop it or throw it away. So <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, we. The things that are really basic to peace are quite simple. You need food, you need a place to stay, uh, and you got to be able to breathe. But beyond that, the human needs are, uh, they become uh, sort of, uh, well, they're just not the basic needs. And what we're experiencing right now is a threat to the very social structure of the world. 
and most people don't care about their political systems. They don't care about the parties. They don't care about anything. They just want to feed their families, send them to school safely, and, and that's good. But when you consider that the store of value is, it used to be gold, and maybe silver, or whatever, and that was very cumbersome, so we replaced it with paper money, and then we replaced it with promises to pay, and then we took away the gold standard. And so if you look at the cyber currencies, they're just another promise to pay. But what they are is they're linked through blockchains, and you can see what's been done, but you can't see who did it. Governments tax based on what you did, and they know you did it. So if you really want to dig down to the deepest level of the threat of the currencies, Bitcoin or whatever they are, and they're developing very rapidly, and Bitcoin is, is uh, not nearly the most sophisticated or best now, it just is the one with the most name ID, then uh, how are countries going to tax if we don't know who's doing what and, and to whom? But if you take a look at ISIS, you, you look at the real threat of terrorism, ISIS was one of the most, it is the richest terror organization in human history. They got that way primarily through four or five main avenues, oil sales, to about a billion dollars a year in oil sales. Uh, then architectural antiques, they're jackhammering things out that have survived all through human history and selling them on the internet. Uh, then kidnapping is, is something that's very valuable. Uh, the extortion that goes on, in other words, they take over regions, go to the banks and simply say, we're going to take the accounts over and we're going to manage those accounts and we'll take uh, some percent, all, or a piece or whatever. And they were very successful at that. I first got engaged in the whole idea of terror financing when I went to the uh, to, uh, talk to the group who is responsible for identifying and stopping terrorist financing and said, at least stop the oil sales. Well, that's very complex. And I said, no, I'm from the oil country. I, that's why that was my business. Not very complex at all. Every barrel of oil either goes through a pipeline, but most of the places don't have pipelines. And so it's going through a truck. It's being carried from a well to there. You don't have to cause environmental degradation. You simply stop that little four inch pipe that runs from the well to the tank battery and from the tank battery to the truck. It's the loading that you can stop very easy. You don't have to blow up the trucks, you don't have to blow up the wells, you don't have to blow up the tank batteries. And that was just seemed too complex for the system to understand. So we allowed a billion dollars worth of oil to be moved to market and understand the, the nature of the moving. The trucks would sit in line for months to get one load of oil, months to get to the front of the line. And we couldn't find a way to disrupt that. But uh, the, the more uh, immediate concerns, uh, the, the systems are now being attacked uh, in, in huge ways. So in Kiev, uh, there was a hack of the system that just suddenly caused ATMs to start spitting out cash. And so ATMs had to be shut down. So I mean, you and I use this for convenience, but our convenience is being used against us. Uh, you can take a look at Bangladesh. The, everyone knows that, that they lost $81 million. What's not as well known is the SWIFT system is what moves financing back and forth across the world, 25 million transactions a day. And everybody uses it. If you're going to transfer from one country to the next, or sometimes from one bank to the next in a country, you use the SWIFT system. And they penetrated the SWIFT system and told the, Bangladesh, told the New York Fed to transfer money. Luckily, they misspelled the word foundation, or the, the, it would have been a billion dollars instead of 81 million, because uh, all of them had uh, misspelled the word except those four transactions that actually occurred. For, uh, uh, the same thing is happening around the world. That Fortinet threat map will show to you the attacks on the system. So you have basically, and I'll wrap up with this, but you got basically three or four major reasons that people get into the hacking system. One is just people love to disrupt systems. They li like to see if they can outsmart the system. Uh, we experience that quite a bit uh, in, our, in our DOD. That's what can we do there to disrupt? Uh, you get criminals, they make a lot of money, uh, and there's almost no consequence. So uh, we're pretty sure who, who accomplished the 81 million heist from Bangladesh. 
but there's no consequence for it and almost none worldwide for any of these. So you have a tremendous opportunity for gain and almost no risk. So you get high reward, no risk. Uh, you're going to invite a lot of players who get better and better and they change by the moment and their process is changed by the moment. So when we're defending now, that's what happened two days ago and the threats now are much more uh, advanced and, and so that constant chasing. Uh, you also have people who want to, they want the disruption of the system. They want the system to collapse and to fail. And, and those are the ones that we really should worry about. Uh, then you've got, uh, just like in my hometown, we have an oil and gas economy. And so you have uh, cartels bringing cash in and buying trucks. They never really move anywhere, but they funnel a lot of money. So a lot of money laundering goes on through legitimate businesses. But what they're doing is undermining the basis of, of finance and, and uh, the, the operation of businesses in, in America. Uh, because of our lax position on beneficial ownership, America has become a haven and maybe the haven for corporate misdeeds around the world. So again, you just, as far as you want to go, the system is being compromised. And so uh, I appreciate uh, Mr. Himes being here with me today. This, this committee is very bipartisan. We, we just, uh, there's almost no room for partisan comments here. Uh, as I took over, you, you can hear the breadth of, of issues we dealt with. And so I took every member and paired them with a Republican and Democrat and you all have a column. Uh, and so if you visualize the whole area of cyber crime and terrorism and illicit finance, you, you've got probably 50 different categories and we picked out 15 of the most important and we put individuals and you, all, you too go and plumb the depths of, of that one issue. And so we've been able to ramp up the, the knowledge in, in Congress pretty quickly, but it's by uh, it's bipartisan effort, uh, and people like Mr. Himes have made that bipartisan effort work. So I'm proud to be here with you all today, proud to be on the stage with him. So thank you very much for hosting this. Nancy, thanks. Thank you. Well, uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you, uh, Nancy, and to the Institute of Peace for having this conversation. Uh, very, very important topic. Uh, thank you, Steve, for, for, for doing this. Uh, we were chuckling in the green room. Uh, it's not easy to find topics that really, truly are bipartisan, but this is one of them. And there's little bonuses. I heard Steve say that the necessities of life are uh, housing, food, and clean air. So I'm taking that as an endorsement of HUD, food stamps, and the EPA. Thank you. We'll, uh, we'll keep that in this room, though. We want, st we want Steve back next uh, next Congress. Anyway, um, I, I really appreciate the topic. It's um, I, I'm a uh, former banker. Uh, I now sit on this subcommittee of financial uh, the services committee, and I actually act as ranking member of the NSA and cyber. Security Subcommittee of the Intelligence Committee. So I spent a lot of time thinking about this and, and in my three or four minutes. Let me just say I am both a technology optimist but also an optimist around our ability to ultimately make sure that the tool, uh, cryptocurrencies, networks in general, the internet, uh, is on balance a force for good. Um, and that when, as, as soon as you go to cryptocurrencies and the, and the anonymity that cryptocurrencies uh, offer and that Congress and Pierce talked about, you spin out the scenarios of, of course, drug dealers and child molesters and terrorists being able to move value um, uh, anonymously. And yes, that's a problem, and we've seen that to be a problem. Um, but there are things that we can and must do. Um, and, and by the way, I'm not sure necessarily that, that we need to start with overall macro framing that is pessimistic. I mean, again, if you talk to people at FBI, CIA, NSA, and said 50 years ago, there will come a moment where no human being on the planet will do anything and not leave a record of that, either on Facebook or at an ATM or under a surveillance camera, those guys would have gotten pretty excited 50 years ago. And that, by the way, offers some really potent challenges to the concept of privacy and how we think about that and who gets access to what information, which is well beyond the scope of this conversation. But my point is that when more and more stuff happens on breakable, observable networks, that's a heck of a tool for both law enforcement and the intelligence community. Again, raising all kinds of issues. But there's a couple of things 
things that I do think we, we, we can and need to do. Number one, make sure that our political leadership is, uh, is educated on this stuff. When I came to Congress nine years ago, not only members of Congress, but quite frankly, senior flag officers and others had no idea what was going on in the cybersecurity realm, didn't really understand the problem generally, and we hadn't invested a lot of time and energy and money in, uh, in, in countering that. That has changed pretty dramatically in the last nine years. Um, but also in the specific realm of, of, of cryptocurrencies uh, and how they might be used for ill, a couple of thoughts we can talk more about. But in addition to making sure that we understand the problem, obviously we've got to arm our FinCENs of the world with the tools to regulate the pieces of this stuff that are, that are the, the pieces of these things that are regulatable. So strong encryption is a huge problem. There is encryption out there that cannot be broken by anybody and that is a problem. But of course around any kind of strong encryption, whether it's cryptocurrencies or, or something like WhatsApp, um, there is a person typing something into a device. In the case of a cryptocurrency at some point there is a tangible good being purchased or moved. There are lots of opportunities around that problem of strong encryption to get at and to learn information about the people who are, who are using those things uh, for, with, with, with malign intent. Uh, and so um, I think, like so many policy questions, this doesn't have a silver bullet, easily satisfying answer. But making sure that our regulatory agencies are keeping a close eye on those elements that they're capable, keep, capable of keeping a close eye on, um, acknowledging that some things are just out there, and this gets back to educating policymakers. There's still a lot of people on the Hill who believe that we could do away with strong encrypt strongly encrypted communications. And that's an old way of thinking, right? I mean, uh, an encrypted communication is very simply a piece of software that can reside anywhere. It can reside offshore, and people can get to it using, using networks. And this all came up in the whole discussion of Apple and San Bernardino and the, the, the terrorists' uh, uh, iPhone. A lot of those issues were surfaced for the first time in both the popular imagination and amongst my colleagues. Um, but making sure that we have our regulatory agencies really facing the 21st century rather than the 19th century. And then, and I say this as uh, more with my uh, uh, hipsy hat on than financial services, um, but the good news is, is that here in the United States and in the West, the UK, NATO, uh, we're as good as it gets in terms of thinking about the threats um, to and the tools to be used against those who create a threat to cybersecurity. So I would never take the bet that this thing that looks scary to us now, the strong encryption that is at the core of, um, of cryptocurrencies, that it will be different from any other technology that anyone in this room has ever experienced, which is to say 20 years from now, maybe 10 years from now, maybe five years from now, we'll look back on it and say, gosh, that's, a, that's, that's antiquated. What an, obsolete piece of, uh, what an obsolete piece of technology. And that's why I think it's important for people who do things behind closed doors in places like Fort Meade or across the river in that direction to make sure that they are leading the way uh, in understanding the technology uh, and making sure um, that we can get as much uh, insight into what bad players are doing. And I know that sounds a little scary on the privacy front, but um, even if you think that we shouldn't be working to do things like uh, de-encrypt strong uh, encryption, uh, I promise you that the Russians, the Iranians, and the North Koreans are doing it. And if nothing else, we need to make sure that we stay out in front of our our potential adversaries in uh, in having the capability to uh, uh, to try to keep some order in what could otherwise be a disorderly realm. So let me stop there and say thank you again to Nancy and the Institute of Peace and to Congressman Pierce for the conversation. Thank you both. Um, and before we plunge into what is both a complicated and sobering topic. Um, I want to start by just asking both of you, in this era of increasing partisanship, how did you come to the bipartisanship of this committee? You, you mentioned a little bit that we didn't have room for it, but that's not always good enough in and of itself. So tell us a little bit about how that's worked for you and what you've been able to accomplish with with that well, spirit. I mean, for me it's it's quite easy I represent a district that's 34 percent Republican I mean so uh, <laughs> so you better be bipartisan you just don't get elected I have to I have to have almost uh, half of the Democrats vote for me to be elected and so it begins right there and and frankly I had an offer from some of my Democrat friends in the state legislature during the last redistricting hey we can give you 10 percent more Republicans and I said why would you do that well, you know, you have to work so hard and they don't vote for you. I said, I'm going to get elected. Uh, I think we should have to work this hard. So for me, 
the most powerful thing we could do is take care of the, the whole gerrymandering thing. Both sides do it, by the way. Uh, but if you represent an 85% Democrat county or 85% Republican county and you are that registration, you can say almost anything. And saying almost anything then heightens the tensions, it heightens the rhetoric. I find myself almost never using the words Democrat, Republican, uh, because it's, it, you begin to categorize people. I talk about my values a lot. You either like my values and vote for me, you don't, and vote against me. Uh, but that's the beginning point for me. I, I completely agree, and, and you've got two rarities here. I have also a purplish district. Uh, my, my predecessors back with a couple of little exceptions were Republicans. I'm a Democrat. Um, and so there's a whole other lesson in that about what congressional districts should look like, whether there should be safe seats, what, what it means to have a safe seat, and who you pay attention to. So I completely agree with what Congressman Pierce uh, said. What I would add to this, though, is there's something that is particularly interesting about this issue broadly, cryptocurrencies. Um, uh, number one, a lot of people don't understand it. Um, that, that probably helps. Number two, um, uh, anything that falls into the realm of national security and keeping Americans safe starts out not being terribly partisan. Look, we'll fight over how much money should be spent on the Pentagon and the CIA and everything else. So they'll, they'll, they'll have, take on a little bit of a partisan sheet, but not much. When it comes to keeping people safe, um, traditionally, whether it's armed services or intelligence, these things, have, these things have started out in a strong bipartisan fashion. And then lastly, I would point out any issue that touches on privacy and networks, the forces are almost a lot less, well, they are a lot less partisan than they are um, somewhere on a uh, spectrum of libertarianism. So, in other words, when I said what I just said up there about making sure that uh, you know people in behind closed doors at NSA are really doing their research to be able to penetrate networks, that would enrage the libertarians on both the left and the right, and that's why I'm careful to say with all due protection of privacy. But my point is that there's less attention between right and left, and more attention between folks who are you know uh, 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 more national security types uh, and folks that are more about, you know, intense civil liberties and privacy. That's, that's where the tension often is in these issues. And what Jim was saying there, the spectrum is usually left to right, and, and we find ourselves falling somewhere on the spectrum. But in certain issues, it becomes circular, so the left and the right meet together, and those are very difficult issues, but, but the privacy issue is probably right there. Right now, I'm wrestling. We, we, we want to reform the Bank Secrecy Act. It hasn't been touched since the 70s. It's way behind time. Things are, the, the threats are moving much faster than the bureaucracy. And the greatest fight on beneficial ownership is coming from my, my libertarian leaning guys. And uh, they would join up with, with the, the left on this issue. And so it's, it's a, just a bare knuckle fight to try to get something done that, that threads this point that Jim's bringing up. Well, it's interesting because this is a new subcommittee, uh, your subcommittee on terrorism and illicit finance. And um, you are really on what is the new frontier of crime, it seems, both you know, for us and internationally. How, how, do you, how do you think of this in terms of the balance between policy solutions, technology advances, um, and what you see this subcommittee able to do as you grapple with these issues? Well, the, the first thing we did is, is get the focus on, on the oil sales. Stop the easy stuff first. That's easy compared to the, to the hacking. Uh, then trying to get with the, national, the international auction houses to, to begin to identify those, those people who traffic in, in the archaeological antiques. I mean, we're seeing the destruction of entire cultures that have survived for thousands of years. And, and so, so just doing those things that we can uh, and then trying to get harmony among the nations. The U.S. is actually, uh, is not very, we're not at the front cutting edge of the cyber security. We, we're actually back in the pack somewhere. So talking to those countries that have handled it very effectively in, in Which, Israel. What are those countries? Israel would probably be high. Australia, I think, is good. Uh, the Thailand has had to wrestle with problems in it. So it's those that have wrestled with it internally rather than waiting for somebody to come save them. One other thing I would add to that is um, on the broader topic of uh, illicit funding, um, I, I point to a solution that I actually think is a solution to a lot of problems and sadly one that we are wandering away from or rushing away from, which is continuing to stand up as a leader globally for a functioning international system of cooperating nation states who act responsibly. 
Um, again, a whole other conversation around kind of the America First concept. I understand where it comes from, but you know. Uh, uh, all of these problems, all of these problems get a lot easier uh, if nation states act responsibly, including including this one. You know, okay, so irresponsible nation state, you probably think I'm talking about Iran and North Korea. Yes, I am. In fact, North Korea, you know, is using many of these tools as a sovereign actor in ways that you would expect rogues to use uh, these tools. But I'm also talking about, you know, Steve talked about, um, about uh, oil trucks. Those oil trucks wouldn't have been worth anything if they hadn't been able to ca cross the Turkish frontier. Um, and so to the extent that we can stand up and cajole and, and push and pull, you know, not just North Korea and Iran into a cooperative international system with a common sets of values, but also some of our NATO allies, um, not to mention the Russians and the Chinese, the more we can stand for, you know, uh, going, quite frankly, in the opposite direction, I sort of feel like we're going internationally right now, all of these problems get easier rather than harder. I think that's an important point in terms of how those international networks and norms can, can be a part of the solution. Um, we have been reading about what Venezuela has done in terms of issuing its crypto, its own cryptocurrency as a means of evading some of the sanctions. There's been a, an American policy response. Um, it, you know, it reads like some sort of old dusty spy novel with, you know, Venezuelan networks and shadowy Russian actors. and. You know, how, how, how effective do you think our response to that will be in terms of addressing what the Venezuelans are trying to accomplish? Well, our response has been pretty clear. I mean, the Treasury issued their, uh, their warning about investing in these things. Look, I... <laughs> You know, be surprised to hear this from a Democrat, uh, but you know, look, if you want to go invest in the petro, you got what's coming. You know, you you you. you know, here's a wildly irresponsible, almost roguish regime that is coming up with an instrument they want to sell you, right? You know, I mean, again, we have an uh, we have an obligation to protect our to protect our citizens, but look, the whole that that to me is not that scary, other than apparently a number of people are going to fall for it, and you are going to deliver a couple hundred million dollars to uh, uh, to a to a pretty corrupt. Uh, to a pretty corrupt regime, but to me that's a little bit of a sideshow. The whole thing doesn't make much sense. Most people who look at this stuff and understand it don't think it doesn't make much sense. Um, so I, I think it's quite likely to go away pretty quickly. Um, but uh, it, to me it's a sideshow to the larger issue of what North Korea is doing in the cyber realm and what ISIS and others can do. If if you look a little bit broader, because I think Jim is exactly right, it's, it's one guy out of desperation trying to create debt or the, finance debt, and, and that's what our sanctions were trying to stop. Uh, but you can you can easily look at the value that accelerated on Bitcoin and what, tens of thousands of dollars just overnight per mm -hmm. per share, and and realize that there is, there, the world is, is very large and it's trillions of dollars and coming up with six billion, which was the intent of Venezuela, coming up with six billion is really not that hard. And so step apart from Venezuela and, and consider the broader issue of, of rogue states or individuals who want to finance whatever. And so you realize then that's the mechanism that terrorist organizations use to fund themselves. They'll go to, and, and they'll set up a, a, a GoFundMe account for some, somebody who's experienced the loss of a home or loss of a family member, a severe accident, it's all made up, but they're able to get tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars, and then you uh, and you take a look nationwide and you look at the Bitcoin prices and realize people people will put money into a lot of things. And, and that potential, um, aside from the question of Venezuela, is still very destabilizing because when people don't have the belief, when, when the truth is unknown, then they're going to retreat away from the systems. The, the magic, the, the wonder of the world economy today is, is the fluid flow of money. And right now, one of the things that, that is being targeted are, is the very basic framework of the financial system. So if we can target the trust in the financial system, the movement of money, those 46 trillion moves in, in one of those structural systems here in the U.S. And if you can just disrupt it a bit, 
then you can freeze everything because people lose confidence. Even the people who, who run the system, if they lose confidence that, that money is escaping out of it, they have to shut it down, a bank holiday, and suddenly you have caused pandemonium to happen, and it's all through systems like you're asking about here. So addressing that issue and building on your comment, Congressman, about the need for national cooperation, there's an, uh, an international entity um, uh, that has been formed specifically to address these issues, IF, sure. um, some acronym. Yes, some acronym. <laughs> some whatever, acronym. Yes. Is that effective? Is that making no. a difference? Does your subcommittee interact with it? So again, I would As a new international this. So body. if you imagine the Fortinet <laughs> threat map up yeah. here, and we're going to be sitting down holding a three-day conference and, and the attacks are coming by the second, and the attacks are changing by the second. They're upgrading. When they find a, 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 a cyber block, they're going to find a way around the cyber block, and that's the difficulty. The systems have to be very, very mm -hmm. fast moving, and mm -hmm. that's not, I, I'm not seeing that in the U.S. systems, and I'm not seeing it in the world systems. And so, yes, it is effective, but it's effective at beginning a conversation. The other side is making billions without risk, and so the stimulation for them to, to create problems is, is maybe greater than ours to solve the problems, and that's, that's what I see is, is the difficulty in any of these, in, even within the U.S. We were visiting at Finson, and so I began to hear, uh, it was hearing from the top people that, that we're really not in the job of enforcement. I said, well, why don't you change your name? Fine after Crimes Enforcement Network, you know? And so we had a discussion with the Secretary of the Treasury when he was confirmed that I think we have a basic question to ask here, what is their function? And so uh, Jim was right, we, we're, we are developing uh, very sophisticated tools, but engaging in the whole international community is, is difficult and, and it's even difficult for us to keep up. So that's, it's, it's a very complex issue and, and your question is right on point. Um, I would just quickly add to that, um, quite apart from organizations, um, I've been interested for a long time and we've been making very slow progress, but we, we really need to prioritize creating the uh, cyber equivalent of the Geneva Convention. Um, and I know State has worked on this, IOP has worked on this, but we, we need to make this a high priority. Um, and again, it, it, it sh I understand why it's hard, you know, Chinese are doing things, we want to retain the ability to do things in the cyber realm. But, you know, again, we have such, we don't have a ton of common interest with Iran and North Korea, but making sure we don't take down each other's electricity networks is one. So for whatever reason, I guess it's gummed up in the UN Council of Experts or whatever it's called, uh, but, um, you know, this really should be a high priority. If, if we don't do it, eventually we're going to get into a tit for tat. Um, and in fact, you know, I sort of felt we should have been more aggressive in demonstrating to the Russians what our cyber capabilities were after the hack. And the, the fear of that, of course, is that it escalates. And it may take that. It may take, you know, Florida being without power for eight hours to pick on one state uh, for us to understand that we should be putting at the very top of our list an effort to codify some norms. It shouldn't be that hard to codify. You know, hospitals. Let's start with hospitals. You're not taking in hospitals offline um, and then expand the conversation from there. Sure, and then and, and to really take Jim's comments and, and move them further, if you take a look, our entire electrical grid is managed through computers. Our entire water supply is managed through a system of computers. If you want to know how easily society can be disrupted, think about those vulnerabilities. And, and that's when uh, Jim is talking about uh, Geneva Convention on this stuff, because now you're undermining the very trust of civil government itself. And if we want chaos in the world, just uh, walk away from, from that. And since Jim's confessing, I'm, I might confess too here that, uh, so he's uh, doing some stuff out in the Republican direction, and I'm sort of doing things out the other direction. Because if you look at the Equifax breach, they actually were using the world's best program, but they became a little sloppy and a little lazy and they didn't put in the latest fix. Uh, the system knew it had a vulnerability and they just didn't install that. They didn't hit the you know, install button. 
And so, so they were then hacked and uh, what, 100 million records lost or something like that. And so, so I sometimes think that, that we need almost a utility, like a utility that is available and, and you simply pay a, a monthly fee and you don't have to keep up with all the installations, that we have a protocol that would, would underlie or overlie. The, the, the Israelis think of an umbrella that simply defends them from the attacks coming in, the umbrella is to deflect, and then each person's got their own level of security. So I don't really have an, a strong opinion if it should be an undergirding protocol or that overarching protocol, but I kind of think that that's, that's where we're going to have to end up because Right now, they're attacking the big institutions. If they really wanted to, if, if the terrorists really wanted to make hay, they'd set up the dollar store of uh, the dollar store concept, and they'd attack all the small banks because that's where the vulnerabilities are. Just take a couple million. You don't have to get a billion at a time. Just take a few million here and there from all the thousands of small banks around, and you realize how vulnerable the system is. And then you do the whole marketing system. It uh, you can. We're very vulnerable in modern society because we're very comfortable and we're very, we have a lot of tools to make our lives easier. Just the ATMs and paying online, all those things are, are points at which the hackers will find, find you and us. I want to open to the audience, who I, I'm sure are feeling very reassured right now. Um, okay, I told her I would sit between her and the window. I'd, I'd just feel bad if she threw herself out. You know? So we have people coming with mics. I'm going to take a few questions. Um, and uh, let's start right here, and then we'll go to Nancy, and then Farhini. Well, thanks very much uh, for your bipartisan support on this issue, which is very important to many of us. I've been working for the past four years, uh, formerly with the State Department, uh, on illicit funding of terrorism and the anti-ISIS coalition. And <clears throat> particularly, I was working on um, the trafficking in illegal antiquities, which I know you've been interested in. We found that there's, st there's still some problems associated with both certain countries to which we can't get agreements like Yemen, which is currently experiencing great instability, and we can't have a bilateral MOU with a country that we don't have a relationship. And we also have a problem with some countries that are not signatories to the UNESCO Agreement of 1972 on the prohibit, prohibition of antiquities. So I guess I was hoping to ask whether, whether you uh, as members would be interested in first uh, doing what you did for Iraq and Syria. and passing a resolution uh, providing emergency uh, closure of our borders to illegally uh, uh, acquired antiquities from Yemen because it's a country at war, a civil war, and or perhaps revisiting your implementing legislation uh, for the 1972 UNESCO agreement since now it's very, very old and perhaps unwieldy, perhaps ceding to the Secretary of the State the opportunity to put emergency restrictions in when countries fall apart. So just Great. a thought. Thank you. Let's take a couple so that we have time to hear voices. So Nancy Hi, and then Nancy Rohini. Zirkin. I'm um, scared, very scared. Um, let me say that I've heard a lot of ideas from both of you how to handle this. Is, the, is there legislation that that embodies those ideas. I understand that that without international players buying in, it doesn't um, help that much. But are there is there legislation, are there talks going on with with our allies on these issues? Adding the Geneva Protocol is very, very interesting. Thank you. And then uh, pass it back to Rohini. Hi, I'm Rohini Srihari from Peace Tech Lab. So, um, you know, throughout the world, we see all these incentives by governments to uh, bring, you know, more people who are underprivileged into the digital economy through establishing digital identities and so on. India had a huge uh, program to do that kind of thing. And the goal there is, is essentially, you know, people who don't even have a bank account, allowing them to participate 
um, in the digital economy. So this is the, the good part of these kinds of technologies. So it seems like there's two things happening simultaneously. All of that stuff is happening where we're trying to bring all these people online with digital identities, which protects them and so on. Um, but are you also now concerned that that's going to exacerbate these kind of issues? Yes, so you, let's, let's handle that package of three. Go for it. Um, I just want to connect the last two. I, I, candidly, I'm, uh, I, I think Congressman Pierce is a lot smarter on antiquities than I am. But, but it, it's I think it's really important to keep perspective here. Um, the blockchain and networks generally are, are going to do dramatic good uh, in the world. I mean, just the ab ability to identify, you, I've read about some of the benefits programs that are getting out into the hinterlands of India, the ability to identify an individual in some remote part of India and make sure that benefits get to that, it's remarkable, it's really amazing. Um, and I don't know, Nancy, that, that, that really scared is, <clears throat> is the right answer there. I, I, I'm exactly the generation when I was in grade school where every single day I went to school with some meaningful possibility that we were going to have global nuclear war, and you know there were going to be 250 hydrogen bombs in the United States, and we were going to be a crater. I, yeah, look, this stuff is cake in comparison to what I grew up in in elementary school, um, <laughs> which doesn't mean that we don't take it seriously. Um, but y y you know, again, the the the, the threats here um, are are I would argue not as intense as they were in the 50s and the 60s and also addressable um, in the sense that um, uh, there are there are constraints um, uh, North Korea Iran China have some pretty scary capabilities about what they might do to us in the cyber realm but they also understand in a classic deterrence framework that we are probably better at that, at that stuff than they are, and so they are deterred. So we go to where we do in so many of these conversations about weapons of mass destruction, nuclear weapons, which is what you really start to worry about are non-deterrable entities, non-state actors, rogue actors, and yes, um, you know, I, again, probably spend a lot more time worrying about a rogue actor getting a nuclear weapon than that there's five programmers acting as rogues, because again, I, you know, a nuclear weapon going off in Manhattan because there's a rogue actor who, who somehow secured one, to me, I think has ripples much more dramatic than, you know, somebody manages to close down, uh, you know, J.P. Morgan for a day or so, which would be pretty catastrophic in and of itself. So anyway, that's a long advertisement for making sure we keep perspective around the dramatic good that these network and encryption devices can do. And also that, um, you know, there are levers that we have and constraints that exist that shouldn't have any of us sort of dwelling on the apocalyptic scenario too, too much. Do you want to comment on sure, the antiquities? Yeah. And yes. Uh, obviously, I'd be interested in it, but I'll also tell you I work very closely with the State Department, and, and sometimes they have sensitive negotiations going on that maybe have been ongoing for years, and so you get throughout a, a resolution in Congress, you simply take it back to square one. So, so I'm always a little bit nervous in Congress getting too involved, but, but I'm interested in stopping the trade. First of all, legislation, um, you, you're just not going to be able to keep bills and laws moving as fast as the system's moving. So we really need strong oversight from Congress of the institutions that are trusted. So FinCEN has tremendous mobility and, and the ability to act and, and to use international actors, but we in Congress can't, can't step aside from it because the, the American people only get to touch it through us. And so that, that oversight capability is, is really remarkably important. And both parties tend to sort of step away from the oversight responsibility, in my opinion, watching for 14 years. So that's a flaw. And then obviously the two systems, you know, getting people into the digital age is also exposing us. The more people are connected, the more one connection can take it. I uh, agree with Jim. I, uh, I want to point out the difficulties because people three years ago, four years ago, we were talking about uh, should we really have uh, cyber, cyber protection? Should that be something that the U.S. is really that interested in? And so, and so you can imagine that, yes, I want people to understand exactly what the risks are that we're facing, but I would agree with, with Jim that we've always faced risks. We're just going to have to be a lot more mobile and agile on this because the, the threats uh, come from so many different sources. So we'll do another round of questions, but I'm going to start it off uh, with a question we got um, from our live feed from a 12th grader at Greenwich High School. 
uh, Renee Lapont Jameson, thank you for watching, who asks, how does the federal government determine which terrorist groups are the largest threats to the U.S. and address them or counter their work in illicit funding? Do you want to take well, that one for Renee? Thanks, Renee. Senior, I hope you register to vote. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for, just register to vote. Um, but thank you for the question. So um, how do we determine who the biggest threats are? Uh, that's a, um, the United States government maintains a formal list of designated uh, terrorists, and that's a calculation that is made on, uh, on uh, a whole series of criteria that, that result in, in, in this list. And it's a list of people who are interested in attacking us, attacking our allies. Um, and then our uh, national security apparatus really does um, uh, a lot of uh, thinking, research, and surveillance to determine where the threats lie. Um, and so a very small group operating in a remote uh, corner of pick a country, Pakistan, uh, without a lot of international connections, without a lot of resources, without a lot of talent is going to attract a lot less focus and attention than a, uh, than a global group like, just to use an example, ISIS or Al-Qaeda, which has shown an ability to build networks around the world to bring in people from all over the place and to recruit uh, people uh, in the West and elsewhere, as well as to set up um, businesses like antiquities and oil and even, you know, do things like explore the use of uh, cryptocurrency. So a lot of your taxpayer dollars go to uh, pay for the people who uh, day in and day out uh, are paid to really analyze where the threats lie and then think about how we best um, how we best uh, deal that. And, and all of our responsibility, you get into realms here that uh, American citizens need to develop strong opinions on. Uh, our national security apparatus always bumps up against uh, the nature, the intensity of surveillance. We had this, uh, 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 Steve's exactly right, on the uh, uh, 702 surveillance program. This is capturing, uh, this is capturing internet communications abroad that sometimes pick up U.S. person information. The parties were really split on, you know, how how powerful should the U.S. government be to suck in communications that may include your email if you are corresponding with a non-U.S. person? That, that's the responsibility of all of us to develop a strong opinion, balancing the need for security against the, the demands of civil liberties. And I would add to that, uh, Renee, the ability to destabilize, uh, affecting stability. I'm, I'm not so interested in, in the former government, democracy, republic, or, or whatever. Uh, we can exist, but stability to me is the key. Uh, we can exist, coexist with people who view governmental systems much different than we do, but stability, if they're exporting instability, then I would take that very seriously. But then, like Jim says, they got to be able to finance it, and that's the reason ISIS was so dangerous. They were the most elaborately funded terror organization in human history, and uh, we should be paying attention to that. So we'll take two quick questions right here in the blue jacket. And if there's one more, yeah, go ahead. Hi, my name's Alexa, I'm an intern at the State Department. Um, I have a question about um, what Congress is doing. You guys mentioned um, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies and that can be traced um, as well as hacks can be traced like, back to the hacker. Um, but what is Congress doing specifically to counter um, terrorism funding that can't be traced, for instance, with the Hawala system? Okay, the Hawala, and then right here, if you could do a quick one. Hello, Justin Marinelli. Um, similar, uh, Congressman, you mentioned that part of the problem with cryptocurrency is tracking the transactions, so not knowing what to um, tax, essentially. But isn't that similar to the problem we have with cash, tra cash transactions now? You trust the waitress made 83 in tips instead of 97, for example. Um, doesn't that mean that at a certain point we just have to say, we trust people are mostly honest and we'll do the best we can to get any more if we can? Yeah, I, uh, starting on the last question first, I, I think given the scale of, of the cryptocurrencies uh, and their ability to be completely invisible, cash is not completely invisible. In other words, it's, a, it's an established system that, that is trackable and, and has an entry point and exit point. Cryptocurrencies don't, currencies don't have that. Uh, then on uh, your first question, uh, all we're trying to do on the cryptocurrencies is, is be aware because there's not too much that Congress can do uh, right now. The Huala system is, uh, many of the people who use it, it's legitimate. That's where uh, you've got a, a representative in this country and you want to ship money over there, so you have a representative over there, talk to the representative here, 
somebody pays here, they email, and the payment's made down there with the, the fee taken out. And so that's a, a, a legit, legitimate form of commerce, except it can be easily, uh, easily misused. And so finding that, that misuse point is, is extraordinarily difficult. Um, any comments on that? Um, digital wallets, uh, <laughs> I'm often tempted to ask, answer the question, what is Congress doing on any problem with not much? Um, uh, look, it is a, it's, a, it's a somewhat dysfunctional body heading into an election, right? So this is just for all kinds of reasons. We're going to be slow in our pace of doing what we will do slowly over time, which is updating privacy laws, updating the Bank Secrecy Act, doing all the stuff that uh, Congressman Pierce <laughs> mentioned earlier. Um, but again, let me, let me fall back on the technology. Uh, we're spending a lot of money to understand um, strong encryption. Um, a lot of the anonymity, if not all of the anonymity, relies on strong encryption. Um, the technologists in the room will know that breaking encryption is a function largely of computing power and, you know, around the world people are really looking hard at uh, quantum computation and other technological ways of addressing it. So my point is simply that don't, there's no technology that we haven't looked backwards 20 years or 10 years or five years or one years later and say, isn't that quaint and obsolete, right? And so that's going to happen here too. Um, we just need to be at the forefront I don't ever want somebody to crack strong encryption that is not us. Um, and because that means everything we do, our military, our nuclear command and control becomes observable to somebody who cracks strong encryption. So I want us at the forefront of that. And then again, if I can make the same plea I did uh, uh, to the young woman at Greenwich High School, um, citizens of the country need to think hard about about what that means and what they want us to do about it. If the government can crack strong encryption, there is no theoretically, theoretically, privacy anywhere ever. Um, and so what constraints do you want to put on that or how much do you want us to keep up with our ability to use uh, tools like that? Congressman Pierce, final comments? Yeah, I, the, I think Jim has really cast a, a very good uh, theme here that that the last thing we should do is just retreat and uh, try to take our money out of the bank, put it under the, the mattress. It's uh, that it will get to that point to where where instability is is everywhere in front of us, and if we will stay engaged, if we're the ones driving the system, then typically the U.S. has as a more global view. In my opinion, it doesn't matter which party. Typically, we we look at things a little more globally and a little bit more for the human human benefit. And that's that value system that comes from us as, as a collective body. And again, it's not associated with any party, any religion or anything. It's just us as people. That's probably the greatest gift that we can give to the world, that, that sense of purpose and in a sense that we're always going to be uh, working toward the right. We may not always be correct and we might not always act correctly. But we generally do that. Uh, Winston Churchill said Americans always do the right thing after they've tried everything else. And we pretty well tried everything else. So. <laughs> <laughs> Congressman, I want to thank both of you for joining us here today. Um, I want to thank you for your bipartisan spirit, both today and um, on your subcommittee. And I think all of us, in particular, want to thank you for you really tackling an issue that's on the frontier of technology and crime and privacy issues and uh, the, a lot of the values that you've laid out for us today and we, we're all counting on you uh, <laughs> to make sure that we collectively as a nation can navigate something that has the potential to undermine the, the fundamentals of our system or to continue to take us forward. So thank you both. Please join me in thanking the Congressman. Thank you. That was